This is Corey Willis with PVI, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. I'm Adam Blattenberg from Diesel World. This is Dan, owner of Dan's Diesel Performance. I'm Cass from Diesel Doctor of Tennessee, and you're listening to the Diesel Podcast. What is going on, Diesel Nation? Glad to have you guys with us today on the number one diesel truck podcast on iTunes. I want to encourage you guys to keep sending in your stories. We've got a lot of really good ones that uh, we're going to be recording and, and getting out there about truck builds and, and guys that have been working on their trucks themselves or just really cool things that are out there going on in diesel. So make sure you follow us on Instagram. Just search at the Diesel Podcast or you can send us an email to info at the dieselpodcast.com. Before we get to the podcast, we want to thank BD Diesel for helping make episodes like this one possible. They're the official injector of the Diesel Podcast and they've got a whole lineup of injectors across any different diesel engine that's out there. Whether you need a stock replacement set or, you know, ones that flow a little bit more, get some better fuel economy, make a little bit more more power, make sure you go to dieselperformance.com. You can search by Duramax, Power Stroker, comes and then by the year of truck that you have, check out what they have going on. Now, on this episode, we're going to be chatting with the guy who has the fastest Duramax on the planet, and he's been doing it for a really long time. We're excited to sit down with him and chat today. His name's Wade Moody. And he's going to be talking to us about how he got started into drag racing and how he progressed all the way to the point of uh, beating the records that Banks had for a Duramax-powered vehicle. And it's it's a really cool story. A lot of things that are going on in the racing side that uh, he's going to shed some light on, talk to us about what he's doing now, and give us kind of a sneak peek about what him and PPI are cooking up, a big release here in, in May. Wade Moody, it is great to have you on the Diesel Podcast today. I'm looking forward to chatting about the fastest Duramax on the planet and and uh, picking your brain on the the racing side of diesel today absolutely good to be here thanks for having me on yeah, tell us a, a bit and for our listeners that it may not they might have seen your vehicles race but they don't know who you are per se is what is what has been your involvement in in racing and diesel performance that allowed you to you know pilot these trucks and these race vehicles and make them go really fast all right, so I'll just give a quick little backdrop. I am a Maryland native, and uh, so I was born and raised here, just outside of D.C., and uh, never really got into diesels until 2004. Um, my father and I had bought two trucks and decided we were going to plow snow with it, and uh, then we ran into the injector issues that everybody so often had ran into and got the runaround from the dealership, and I said, you know, I said, I've worked on everything my entire life, why am I going to a dealership just to get told, you know, this is the problem, then that's the problem, you know, and, and get the runaround. And I said, you know what, I'm going to do this myself. I'm going to go to school. I'm going to learn some things and I'm going to study and just work with my hands. And that's exactly what happened. So initially we uh, started as a drive-in service business and, you know, hence the name NGM Diesel Performance. NGM is my son's initials for those who don't know, uh, Nathan Garland Moody. And uh, I named it after him because uh, the same year he was born is the same year we actually had an official business. And um, so that's how that came about. And so right around 2008 of uh, running the business, the economy took a slump, and I decided, you know, my heart really isn't in doing drive-in service. My heart was always into doing the performance side of things, you know, engines, how they work, why they work, how to make them better, how to make them more reliable. And so uh, we geared more towards or out of the service part and directly into the engine and performance side of of the Duramax. And it actually started with the Cummins, now that I think about it, and then it kind of went off into the Duramax. I haven't done a Cummins engine, gosh, in probably five years or so now. Um, So we're pretty much 100% Duramax now. But um, looking at what was out there, you know, Gail Banks was a huge inspiration, seeing how he was going out there and going fast and always said to myself, you know, I think I can go faster than him, but I had to figure out a plan on how to do it. Yeah. And I have a past experience in automotive and motorcycle uh, repair and racing and things like that. So I always had a niche for looking at things from an engineering aspect, figuring out how to make something better, how to keep it lasting longer, go faster, produce more power, you know, the whole deal. Now, as far as with taking the Duramax platform in the direction that you did, is it because you're you're a GM guy or, you know, because a lot of listeners are going to say, well, why not just use a Cummins? Like Cummins does everything, you know, because we have, we have a lot of fans of each brand. And I'm always curious why a, a racer uh, or, or a builder really hones in on a particular engine platform. 
All right, so just to set the record straight, I was a Cummins guy to, from, from Jump Street, mainly because the inline engine is such a popular and well-known engine. They're in tractors, they're in big rigs, they're in pickup trucks, you know? Mm -hmm. And so my first diesel was a Cummins. And, man, I loved them. My dad still has his original. Um, so it was kind of a staple, you know, for diesel performance or just diesel in general. You know, you just want good mileage. You want to tow your trailer, drive to the grocery store, fire up your Cummins, you just go. But when it came time to get involved in racing, which after the drive-in service stopped, and the racing side, engine building side, started in 2000, late 2007, early 2008. That's when we decided, you know, we really need to make something that's going to be better than what's currently out there. And I knew Gail had started his new project, and he had done well with his Sidewinder truck using a Duramax platform. And I, you know, looked at what he had done, and I said, you know, absolute genius. I mean, nobody in their right mind would race a Cummins in something that needs to go fast, turn RPM, and make horsepower. And that's coming from a Cummins guy. I looked at it from an engineering aspect, not from a, you know, I've got to have my same cup of coffee every day from the same place type <laughs> mentality. So I looked at it, and it was tough because I didn't want to not use the Cummins. My initial thoughts were to use the Cummins, but the more I studied it, the more I saw its flaws. I said, you know, it's not going to work for our end goal. What was the end goal? to beat Gail and to set records that had never been attained prior, um, not just in ET, but also a mile per hour. And the Duramax platform gave us the packaging that worked. It was a V8 design, so it wasn't as long, wasn't as tall, and it gave us the ability to um, implement, you know, um, engineering uh, market first that hadn't been done before. And I always wanted to try different things with the V8 platform or the diesel platform that nobody had done. And uh, although we had a lot of flack about it, you know, we were uh, able to make aluminum rods go in a diesel engine. We were the first to do that. We de-stroked the cranks and uh, we changed the camshaft profiles and we did so many things that allowed that engine to breathe and operate better. And we found out real fast why the Duramax was going so fast in Gale's uh, truck. And uh, then we decided to put one in our own pro stock truck. And uh, from then, it was uh, all she wrote. Now, we're going to have the title of this podcast be Fastest Duramax on the Planet. you got to tell us the story behind, <laughs> behind getting that title. <laughs> okay, so we first started the engineering project on the pro stock truck and the engine development back in late 2007, early 2008. And we had a truck, a pro stock truck. It was a, uh, a Gebhardt pro stock truck. It was an S10, 125-inch wheelbase. Everything was just pure factory engine placement, you know, exactly like a pro stock truck would have been. Um, the only difference was it had a fiberglass body. And back then when they did fiberglass, it was, I think it was heavier than the, the metal bodies that were on there. It was really heavy. So um, we got it running and got it together and got everything worked out right around 2010. So we started making passes at the very end of 2010. And um, little by little, we started chipping away. I think um, in 2010, we were running like a five, I want to say a 530 or something in the uh, eighth mile. And that was with a clutch and a Linko and just us being a bunch of idiots to the racing scene. We just didn't know what we were doing, you know, to be exact. The engine side was more of a staple, but the tuning a race car was just a complete uh, new thing for us. So we had to work through our issues and uh, we changed some, some things with the uh, chassis going into 2011. And that really helped us. So in 2011, we started to push that down into the 5.0 range. And, um, you know, moving forward from that into 2012, we got into the uh, 490s. We ran a 496, I think, at the very beginning of 2012. And then it was 2012 where we went a 758, I think it was, at 180 miles an hour, which, had, which officially beat Gail Banks' fastest time. And... We did that for the um, race organization, um, NADM. Most people, uh, I don't even know if they are operating anymore, but that used to be the organization that we raced with back then. And uh, so that was the fastest Duramax on the planet at that time. I got a lot of Internet squawking about, oh, well, it was NADM. You need to go to a real race organization. NHRDA is where it's at. So the very next year, that's what we did. 2013, we won 
almost all of our races. We won the national championship, the world championship, and set a record at almost every race we entered. We ended up getting it down to a 740 at 188 miles an hour. And uh, the official record was a 746 at 186, I think. Um, the, the faster time was uh, in testing. What is it like to go 186 miles per hour? <laughs> well, back then it was really fast. Um, but the more you drive, the more you get used to it. It's, I guess, kind of like anything. The more you practice mentally, the better mentally you become prepared for it. And and physically, it's one of those things that I'll just tell you a quick story. I was I never came from a family of drag racers. So drag racing wasn't my forte. I had to force myself to get in the car, memorize all the different uh, things that had to happen, you know, for the burnout, for starting it up, for going down the track, for shifting, for shutdown, for everything. And to the average person that just looks at it, it seems, oh, that's simple. Anybody can do that. Well, there's a reason why grandma isn't out there doing it. It's not for everybody. So, you know, I would find myself sitting in the car in the shop just going over my routine, going over my plan, getting myself mentally prepared for what I was going to do. And I'll admit, it was very fast. There were times, probably one of the first few passes, I remember getting out and saying, Lord, I can't do this. This is just too much. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. And this is uh, early on. And, uh, man, you know, pulled through and made the best of it, and it became like second nature. So it is fast. It's not for the faint of heart. It is what most people call a rush, but it's also very dangerous. At the very beginning of 2014, um, we had, in testing, put down some times that would have equated to what guys are running now in pro mod class. Um, we had a uh, 106, 60 foot out of that truck, and we had clicked it off early in second gear and ran a uh, three flat to the 330. And so that would have easily put us somewhere in the 450s or 440s. Uh, we had gotten it, you know, the the power plant, we had found another 500 horsepower out of that thing, and so it just really started picking up, and it was running really good. And uh, we just started running into issues with blowing up injection pumps and things like that. So we were just fighting things. We could never get a clean pass, it seemed like. That was the only clean pass that we had gotten before I wrecked it. Went down to South Georgia Motorsports, Ryan Milliken's in the other lane. My buddy there, he uh, burned me down, didn't get in the bulb, so I'm sitting there. <laughs> You know, basically got the car on fire. I bet you I had it spooled up for about, I don't know, 12 or so seconds. And transmission fluid had gotten so hot. As soon as I left the line, it just started puking transmission fluid, and it got squirrely. And I thought I had ran out of it. I let off the throttle, squared up, and then started pushing again. And it started coming alive, coming alive, coming alive. And as soon as it got about 300 or 400 feet, that rear end came around quicker than I could steer it, and I went right into the wall. And... uh yeah, that was it. It totaled the truck, unfortunately, and that was the end of its reign as, uh, you know, being raced on a uh, weekend basis. Now, what's the, what are you working on now? What, what are you, what are you, uh, you know, going to be doing on the race side of things to, to kind of, you know, bridge from there to, to, you know, the future. And it seems like diesel just going faster and faster and faster and oh, everything's yeah. improving and, and, you know, staying on top of the, the game, so to speak. So um, I'm only into 2014 at this point of my uh, conversation with the, uh, the, the truck. So 2014, we, we wrecked it. We literally took off almost a whole year, and I started building a dragster. And we raced one race at the very tail end of 2015. And within three passes, we were running seven flat. And I want to say we were 196 miles an hour. So we were 15 miles an hour up and four tenths faster than we had ever gone just in the dragster and then the very next year we were able to solidify our program we were running uh we went six we, that, that's correct we were the first duramax to go in the sixes and the first duramax to go over 200 mile an hour in 2016 we also swept the odss and nhrda championships so that was a really good year for us 2017 with the dragster we were in the points lead, doing really well, and uh, I had an injector that uh, busted a nozzle, and it just totally grenaded my engine, and to the point where it needed sleeves, it needed a crank, it needed so much stuff, and I didn't have that stuff as spare parts back then, so that kind of ruined my season, and at the same time, we decided, well, 
since the season's pretty much over and we need to wait two months for parts, let's uh, go ahead and change out the electronics and try to upgrade. So we did. We upgraded to the MoTeC electronic system. Again, that was the first Duramax running with the MoTeC. And we came out at the very tail end probably in September of 2017 just to finish up a couple races and uh, try to get our feet wet with, uh, with the new electronic system. Fresh motor, um, you know, and everything. We, uh, we finished third in the series for NHRDA and NHRDA, even after missing two or three months of racing. So it worked out pretty good for 17. And then last year, we ended up winning uh, the ODSS championship and um, setting a record there. So the world's fastest diesel got even faster. It seems like every year it got better and better as we became better um, with our engine program and with our chassis program. And we won a 411 at 180 in the eighth mile. And the only quarter mile track that we ran was in Kentucky for NHRDA. And we had an eighth mile shutdown coasted to a 650 at 174 so we were we were on our way to going probably in the 30s 630 or so in the uh, quarter mile but the track had a really bad transition in other words there was a, a bump going from the uh, eighth mile to the quarter mile and last thing you want to do is keep powering through that well I thought I could and the dragster went sideways really bad and you know so I just let off hit the parachutes and shut the car off just to be on the safe side. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the safety side of this with how fast you're going and probably how, you know, like just to think about it as someone who's never gone that fast is how quick your reactions have to be. And, and I think driver safety has also started to take a, a really, uh, just be at the forefront of what a lot of guys are doing, whether it's ODSS or just different things that they're racing in is how big of a, a part does safety play in what you do and what you've done over the years in building these vehicles and racing them? Yes, yeah, safety is paramount. I will say that um, when I wrecked the truck in 2014, I had the Hans device on. Not the Hans. It was um, it was something similar to, to the Hans. And it was the first time I had worn it. And thank God I did because, you know, the impact was great enough where I had bruises from my shoulders to my stomach from the, the impact and on the inside of my legs and the steering wheel was folded in about three inches. Wow. So um, if I didn't have that on, I probably would have been injured quite a bit more than I was. I did have a concussion. It was really bad. My helmet got banged up on the, uh, the bars pretty bad. And I felt kind of like I was in a daze for about, I don't know, two weeks. So it was kind of rough. I remember, you know, thinking the impact didn't feel that bad, but the after effect was really bad. And I'm just thankful I had the head and neck restraint and a good helmet and good equipment. Um, I didn't get injured other than, than a concussion. So thankful for that. But, yeah, safety is paramount in today's speeds, you know, and chassis weights and horsepower levels and, you know, with the inconsistency of the racetracks, yeah, you really have to be safe. And I would say to anybody that wants to get into racing, Spend your money on safety before you spend your money on horsepower because safety is going to carry you to the next day. Horsepower may not. So that's something you definitely want to think about. And I know the chassis are getting better. The, the uh, certifications from IHRA and HRA and SFI are getting more stringent, which is a good thing. Some of it's a hassle, but, you know, it's not worth your life. So I would certainly just not uh, – you know, not second guess it, just do the right thing and make sure you're safe. And uh, as far as reaction time goes, yeah, um, you have to be really quick thinking to operate a vehicle like this and not just to leave the starting line in front of your competitor, but also to make your gear shifts. I shift manually. I don't rely on electronics. A lot of guys don't know that. Um, I'm a manual kind of guy where I want to shift the gear when I'm ready for it. And when the car gets crossed up or starts shaking the tires or spinning the tires, I steer it, you know, and you have to know when to let off the throttle, when to get on the throttle, how hard to counter steer or, or steer with the, you know, the way the chassis is facing. It's, it's kind of feel and experience. There really is no book on how to do that. And um, it's just seat time that really helps you to know what to do when you're in a, uh, a situation that's kind of out of control or can get out of control. 
and the cars the way they handle today are uh, a lot better than what they used to be. Now, I saw some things recently on social media with with uh, you guys and PPI working on some stuff, and I, I don't know quite what it is, what you guys got planned, but is there any uh, any light you can shed on, uh, on what you guys are, are doing here in 2019 and, and heading into 2020? Yeah, so uh, PPEI, they started supporting us last year. And I guess they were just getting their feet wet, you know, trying to see what we could offer them as a, um, as a race team uh, collaboration. And uh, they liked what we were able to do. And, uh, man, we love the way that their program operates. So I went to, you know, Corey this winter at one of the trade shows and uh, asked him about a particular project I had in mind and if he was uh, interested in it. And, you know, yes, a thousand times yes, basically is what the answer was. <laughs> and um, I can't say a whole lot about the project other than um, we're building something special. We're building something that's going to just blindside everybody, and I think it's going to be another record setter of massive proportions. Um, we've done our homework. We've got uh, probably the best in safety equipment, the best in uh, chassis design, and we definitely have the absolute best in engine design. I'm constantly doing engine development to come up with new ideas and things that work better than what's out there right now. And uh, Corey has allowed us to be able to do that and make the best out of the uh, time we have available. So with that being said, um, it'll probably be in May sometime before we're able to unveil it and move forward um, with the project and show it off. Cool. That's right around the corner, too. So I, I, we're all going to be looking forward to seeing what you guys have cooked up and, and what's going to be hitting track. Yeah, it's going to be pretty awesome. Uh, I'm. I'm like holding myself back. I really want to tell people about it. I know Corey does. It's so exciting. It's, um, I think it's going to be so newsworthy. There's probably going to be more than one magazine knocking the door down to get pictures and get write-ups and, you know, the whole bit on uh, what's going on. So, and it, we're not going to be able to make the first race of the season, but good things come to those who wait. And like I mentioned earlier, safety has got to be 100% at the forefront and we're not going to come out until we're ready to dominate. And so anyone that uh, knows us knows that we don't like to test at the racetrack. We like to – or not test on race day, sorry. We don't like to test on race day. We like to win on race day and be competitive on race day. So we're going to do our testing. We're going to work through our issues before we come out and make sure that we're ready to make a statement. I think that is one of the really refreshing things about racing – from the outside looking in and, and watching it is just sometimes we can build up anticipation for a truck or something to, you know, what's it going to do? How's it going to perform? And that's probably maybe the second or third pass that the truck has had. And there's going to be growing pains with any vehicle and any setup, but it's so nice to have the anticipation, then see the vehicle go out and it performs consistently because it's our, it's been tested. It's, it's been put through its paces any small changes or things that have need to be done, you guys already did. And as a spectator, that that's really cool to watch and see it, and you get a good show out of it. Yeah, one of our goals um, over the years has been to kind of model after what Gail has done. You know, make it to where the race car shows well, looks well, sounds well. And we've been able to take that and amplify it, where we can make the sound better, we can make it look better, we can make it go faster. Um, something that we do work on, more often than not, is working through the issues on smoke control. The faster you go, the harder it is. Some guys will disagree with that, but not everybody has the exact combination we do. We fight little things, electronical issues, sensor issues, just dumb stuff that seems to hang us up from being perfectly clean from launch till uh, the end of the track. Now, we are clean after launch going down the track. It's just that initial spool up is something that we are going to be honing in on and working on and we are going to try to uh, make that more um, more visually appealing to the fans because I know some people like smoke, but of all the people I talk to, I would say it's an 80-20 mix. 80% want to see the car going down the track, and the other 20% just, you know, they're coal rollers, you know, which I guess in their own right is fine. It's their business, but 
you know, it does kind of put a bad eye or a black eye on our industry. We need to kind of watch out for that. We need to do our part to be responsible with that. And um, hopefully, you know, us as a race team can um, create a better image for our sport. I think that's really important right now with tons of different things that are going on. And I think it's it's kind of under a microscope. And, and sometimes, you know, people's first they'll see diesel trucks, you know, driving around and stuff. But when you actually see the competitive side of it and you go to a track or you see it on a live feed or something and there's just tons of smoke everywhere, you know, not everyone is like, Oh, Hey, that's great. That's awesome. And it's just a, it's a trend that's been happening for a while. And I think to see the race vehicles be able to run as fast as they do, get the mile per hour that they get, and it's not a smoke show because it's all efficiently set up it is a testament to itself. And I think all the work that goes into it and the parts and the engineering and the, the planning. Yeah, absolutely. Like when we used to go to gas events um, back, back in 2011 and 2012 and 2013, we used to race with an organization called the outlaw. Um, I'm sorry, outlaw pro mod, North Series, something like that. I can't remember. It's been so long. Oh, Northeast Outlaw Pro Mods. That's what it is. And they used to love having us there running with the Pro Mod guys because it was a diesel, sounded like a gas engine, but didn't smoke. And so that was really appealing. And the amount of gas-catered crowd folks that would come over, want autographs, talk about the engine, take pictures, we were constantly busy. I would say just as much, if not more, than we were racing at a diesel event, which to me showed that there's interest outside of our core market that I think a lot of folks could tap into and bring awareness and interest from our sport into their arena. That's that's really key, I think, all the way around, because, if one, if, if, if you're able to pull interest from other kind of, say, types of fans, well, then there's more people at diesel events. So if there's more people at diesel events, they're probably buying more product. And if they're buying more product, then the companies who make the product can now have, you know, a new a new market or new people to sell to. And there's just, it, it all feeds off of itself in a way that you know, from racing to parts to shops that install the parts to people who just follow on social media or are fans of racing or a particular truck brand, it all feeds together. So I think that's really cool. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, that's something I've long agreed with, thought of, and even advocated for is that, um, you know, anybody that goes to the racetrack is using their truck. And most yeah. of them have a diesel truck. And if they don't have a diesel truck, then they got a diesel generator. Or if they have both of that, you know, there's there's something diesel in most people's line of equipment. And so when you can relate diesel racing, diesel performance, diesel technology to a regular Joe, you know, they start looking at it like, huh. I might want to use that tuning company or, Hey, I might want to use that, that product or whatever it is, um, fuel additive, oil, whatever for my diesel stuff at home. And so then the product sells itself just because you were in an area where there was lack of knowledge where people have never seen it before, but the interest is drawing them because they can relate to it. And that I think is something we can do better as an industry. Yes. We do need to clean up the smoke, but we also need to make our image, um, better and more well received. And for our listeners out there that want to see what you guys are going to be kind of debuting, releasing in May, and, and just see what you're working on throughout the year, where can they follow you on social media? How do they find you? Okay, so to follow me on social media, I have a couple of different outlets. Instagram is NGM Diesel Race Engines, or at NGM Diesel Race Engines. That's Instagram, and then I have NGM Diesel Race Team on Facebook. Those two are the main outlets that we make publications on. Cool. I'll make sure we put a, a, a link when we uh, we post up on Facebook and Instagram, so anyone interested can go over, give you a follow, check out what you're doing. And I definitely want to have you back on, say, around May, when you can talk about what you guys have been working on. <laughs> I want to have you back on and, and jump more into the Duramax engine itself and yeah, absolutely and just talk to you about you know we get a lot of questions from our listeners like 
hey, you know, what's what's a weak point on on the Sturmax? At what point is this going to happen? Um, how do how do you make one live at this kind of power level? What are some different things? So that's a whole other podcast in itself. But it'd be great to have you back on and chat about that. Yes, it would. And to tag on to the uh, media outlets, um, you will also find not just myself being on there, but also my son. Nathan does race the Junior Dragster, and uh, he will also be with us racing at the diesel events, most of the diesel events and some local events here. So he's also um, on the the, uh, media outlets as well. So if you don't see something in particular on my project or what I'm working on, you'll also see what's going on with my son and his racing program. Oh, that's cool. He's getting a head, getting a head start. <laughs> well, he absolutely loves it. Um, he's played soccer since he was four, and he has only raced since September. And he's like, Dad, I'm ready to give it up. I just want to race forever. <laughs> he's like, I love it. <laughs> I mean, he went uh, – he's actually got some pretty cool stats for himself. Um, his first couple of races, he was able to go triple zero reaction time, which is a perfect reaction time, a couple of different times, and dead on his dial-in. Um, so we're real proud about uh, – him being able to do that i've never gone triple zero just so you know i have <laughs> hundreds of passes and hundreds of wins and tons of records and championships and this guy has never gotten a triple zero <laughs> never <laughs> so i'm really proud of him and uh, you know the lord's just given me a great son he has similar interests and uh, he's got a really good heart so we're definitely thankful for that well we appreciate you being on the podcast today wade look forward to seeing what you guys they're uh, releasing here pretty soon, and then t- talk more about racing and engines and, and, and other things that you know, our listeners are going to love love hearing about, especially the Duramax guys, and and, uh, and and just be able to learn more about what's what's going into the power plants, what's what's making them you know hold up and and, and go as fast as they do when you know out there a lot of people don't know that they don't know all that goes into it or don't think that 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 engine can do what you've already done with it, you know, but it's, it, it's kind of becoming, I think with power more mainstream, like a thousand horsepower used to be a big deal or now it's just like, eh, it's a thousand horsepower, you know, now it's like 1500, 1800, 2000, 2500. You know, how are we going to do that? And, and so, uh, that'd be really cool to chat with you about that side of it. Absolutely. I know me, my crew and PPEI, we are all excited to tell you guys a whole lot of stuff as time moves forward. And uh, I think the listeners and yourself and the media will be really eager to hear it all. Don't forget, diesel fans, make sure and head on over to dieselperformance.com. Pick up an injector set for your truck. If you've got an old, tired, worn-out set or looking to get some better fuel economy, make a little bit more power, BD Diesel has a ton of different options for you. And if you're interested in any tuning, need to bring those injectors to life, check out PPI. Go to ppi.com. They've tuned a bunch of different platforms with EFI Live, Easy Link. And if you've got the combination, they've seen it dozens of times. They've been doing it a long time and have tuned a ton of trucks that are on the Till next time, keep the shiny side up.